These are the seven most hated commanders in the entire format and their decks. I'm Mia, and I think the red tasting drinks taste the best. I'm BZ, and blue is the best artificial flavor, and we're the Nipicking Nerds. Uh, we make videos every single day, literally every single day, and we are helped, powered by Cool Stuff Inc. You can use code NERDS when you check out to buy the cards you were going to buy anyway to save 5% off your order. We were also sponsored by Dragon Shield, if the best sleeves in the multiverse. Good sleeves. I know he was revving up. You can use our EU and US links in the description below to buy sleeves. So we get helped a little and you get the best sleeves in the multiverse. Good sleeves. Again, I can't stress that enough. Uh, Moxfield is a sponsor. You'll see him somewhere in the middle of this video. And happy birthday to everyone whose birthday is today. And super quick shout out. We are slightly under the weather, uh, but this is being recorded on Monday. And this upcoming weekend, we're going to be at Commander Sealed. So if you're there, come play some games with us. But we got to get into commanders that are the most hated. We're going to explore some of the most hated commanders in the format, do a deep dive into their decks, and just talk about why they're such boogeymans of the entire commander format. One of them being Turgrid, God of Fright. I think everybody knows this and just like recoils a little bit. It's three black black for a four or five menace creature that says, whenever an opponent sacrifices a non-token permanent or discards a permanent card, you may put that card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. There's also a back that's Turgrid's Lantern for three and a black, but that's a legendary artifact that if you tap it, target player loses three life unless they sacrifice a non-land permanent or discards a card. You can also play three and a black to untap it too. But no one's really using that side. Yeah, you forgot that was even there. Turret is here because she is a five mana four five that when coupled with one of dozens of several cards that force mass discard or mass sacrifice just sort of takes a lot of the board and just goes pulls it over to you. So the Turgrid very much hated, possibly one of the most hated commanders in the format. She was being called for bans for months, and people obviously have quieted down on that because rule zero exists, but we're going to talk about some of the cards that make this deck tick. It's a pretty dirty deck. I'm actually not sure if I've ever seen one of these in the wild, like out randomly, because people are so like on it about it and just know that people don't want to play against it. Shout outs to Shuffle Scuffle alumni Tim Rude. He's played Turgid against me many times. And one of the cards you'll see is Awaken the Erstwhile. It's five mana. Everybody discards their hand and makes a 2-2 zombie for each card discarded this way. The zombies are kind of whatever. I always thought that they kind of cancel each other out. But the discarding your hand part means that everything in your hand mm -hmm. is now on Turgid's board. And you have no hand to combat any of it, so you're basically just dead in the water. Yeah, you know that those few 2-2 two, two zombies are not going to matter in the end when you're taking some of their best creatures that they're saving for a later turn or something. Yeah, even if you dis even if everybody discards seven cards, all right, Turgrid's enemies have 21 zombies, but Turgrid has seven zombies too. And then Turgrid's going to get, what, at least 10, 15 permanents from among that stuff? It's just not beatable at all. Yeah, it's not like your enemies just have all one ones in their hand. You're not just getting a bunch of little mana dorks or something. You're getting some juicy stuff. It's like, oh, it's an Eldrazi. Oh, it's a creature with an ATB. It's like Arkin of something, an Arkin of whatever. Any Arkin will be good here. It, yeah, Awaken the Earth while is dominating. Uh, yes, Grimoire, while you're doing that, why don't you just let opponents discard a card and then you draw for it? How about that? I mean, that's just so much value, you know? You're just going to have this stacked hand, and they're going to have nothing. It's all going to be on your board. Yeah, and it triggers for each card. So, like, if they discard three cards, you still draw three cards from, from one person. So, like, obviously, with uh, with Awaken the Earthspire we just talked about, that's, like, triple Wheel of Fortune for you. Uh, Memory Jar is another one. This one's, like, dirty, and I hadn't even really thought about it all the way, but it's five mana for an artifact. Tap, sacrifice it. Each player exiles all the cards from their hand face down and then draws that many. At the beginning of the end step, you discard your new hand and you get your old hand back. Discard the hand, huh? And this is activated at any point, so I can go right before my turn. Whoop, we all draw seven. No one can cast anything because they're all tapped out. And then uh, they all discard them and I will take every single one of them. Yeesh. I mean, it really makes sense why Turgor players, it's like either you kill the player or they kill you, right? I mean, that's basically how Turgor goes because any of like these haymakers followed up by Turgor, at least these couple are like five mana. So it's like, well, maybe on turn 10 or turn eight, you can play Turgor and follow it up with these and the game's over immediately. Can't really tap out for Turgor on turn five and then you know, hope to untap every time. So there's a little bit of give and, give and take, but this next one might make that a little bit trickier. What is the next one? The next one's Thought Seize. For one black, it's a sorcery. Opponent reveals their hand. You choose an online card. They discard it, and you lose two life. And I think this is really interesting considering you don't usually see this in Commander. You ever. see it in, like, Modern. Not a card you ever see in Commander, but because you can go 
Turgrid followed right up, but spend one mana, take the best card in someone's hand, and just put it in play under your control. Now if they kill Turgrid, you're like, all right, whatever, I got a big giant threat out of it. I got a great henge, I got a, I got a smothering tithe, I got a, name a big creature. Uh, Blightsteel Colossus? I got a Blightsteel Colossus. Don't, don't do that at home. Don't try that at home, kids. We're trade professionals. What's the next card? Next card is Soul Shatter for Tuna Black Instant, one of BZ's favorites. Each opponent sacks a creature or Planeswalker with the highest man value among creatures and Planeswalkers they control. So you're getting a three for one instantly, and it's all going on your board. Sacrifice, A. Eh? Plus, this kind of doesn't really let them sacrifice in the way that, like, Flashback Marauder does. They don't sacrifice your worst thing. You sacrifice your biggest thing, your, your most expensive thing, probably your best thing. I will take it. Thank you very much. It's like an interaction that you're going to play anyway. And part of that makes Turgrid just so brutal. Like, even a Turgrid followed up by a Soul Shatter um, on the same turn. Very feasible uh, possibility. Very possible play. It's so brutal. The game feels over. You just can't come back from that. I mean, it gets around indestructible and hexproof and all that, too. So this is just a great 3-for-1 bonus that you just happen to get it. Yeah, it feels like a 9-for-1. And this is, just, this is just every card in the Turgrid deck. Uh, you know... Without Turgrid, Soul Shatter's a three for one. Great removal spell. With Turgrid, you probably lose. You just have to keep it dead at all times. How about the next one? The next one is Smokestack. For four mana, at the beginning of your upkeep, you put a smoke counter or soot counter on it. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, they sack a permanent for each soot counter on Smokestack. So everyone's, you're going to be getting so many counters on this. And around the board, it's like, oh, they'll sack three of their best creatures or three lands or something. And you're just going to be getting that much more advantage. Yeah, and the fun part about Smokestack is that at the beginning of your upkeep, you get two triggers. You can either put a soot counter on it first, or you can sacrifice a permanent for each soot counter on it. So when you untap with it the first time, you just sack zero things first, then put one counter on it. So everybody's like playing catch up, trying to like lose all their stuff in like the least backbreaking way possible. This works if Turgrid's out. This works if Turgrid's not out because you just go, great, everyone loses all their stuff. And if Turgrid's out, obviously their decisions are so brutal. <laughs> That's rough, especially when some people think that at one point it's like, oh, maybe the best thing is to get rid of lands. Like, oof, I don't want to be making that choice. And when you see a deck full of cards like this where the best decision you can make is maybe sacrifice the land, I can see why people don't want to play against that. It's pretty uh, miserable. Let's end it with a bang. I love this card, but I used to play the modern. This is Death Cloud X, Black, 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 Sorcery. Each player loses X, discards X, and sacrifices X creatures. And then, just for fun, sacrifices X lands. If you play Turgrid and you land a Death Cloud, no one has literally anything. There's no board, there's no creatures, there's no lands, there's no anything, and it's just all in play under your control. How could you possibly lose from that scenario? Your board is just stacked at that point, and you're, if they land this, you go, yeah, I'll scoop, it's fine. Yeah, and all the lands enter untapped, because Turgor doesn't say they enter tapped, so you just get to like take extra turns, basically. I, I mean, Death Cloud, I like Death Cloud. I don't like it enough to build a Turgor deck, let's, let's put it that way. Yeah, I think the target will just be on you at that point. The next most hated commander is probably one of the commanders that's been hated for the longest out of the entire run of the format. It's Narset Enlightened Master. Three blue, red, white for a 3-2 first strike. Hexproof, that's always fun. Whenever she attacks, exile the top four cards of your library. Until end of turn, you can cast non-creature spells from among those cards for free. So if you attack with Narset, great. You attack with her, flip four cards, anything that's non-creature, going in play. Which leads me to think, hmm... I sure do want that trigger again. So I would love to either take an extra turn or an extra combat or just throw a 10 drop and play and then the game right there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think this is definitely one of the biggest do not play or like kill the player immediately commanders since commander started. I mean, with this one, it's very feasible that you just go, you could go nothing, 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 nothing. Turn six, Narset. No one can kill it because it's hexproof. Untap, attack, win. And that's really scary for a lot of people, and that's not interesting gameplay for a lot of people, myself included. I would not really want to play against this, so I don't. I think that with power creep, it is being pushed towards the wayside a little bit because of things like the six mana cost and things just like going a lot faster with combos lately. Yeah, we're not saying that these are all CDH or they're the best commanders in the format. They're the most hated. People hate this. Uh, one of the things the nurse that's going to want to do is seize the day. It takes... It untaps a creature and gives you an extra combat phase, followed by an additional main phase. And it has flashback for three, so you can play for four, or attack with Narset, flip off of it, hit, seize the day, untap or get an extra combat. Now, assuming she survives, she probably will. Three, two, first strike with three opponents means you're going to hit one of them, most likely. So then you get another combat, flip four more cards. Now, if you have three lands, you can flash it back, get another one, flip four more cards, and just start cascading and just chaining all of these extra triggers, extra turns, extra whatever, 
game winners and there's nothing your opponents can do about it. Yeah, and if you can't get extra combats, why not just extra turns with time stretch? You know, just take two extra turns after this one. You know you want to. Yeah, it's not a 10 mana spell. It's a zero mana spell. Two extra turns. I would probably concede. I don't know if there's... <sighs> I'm trying to think. I don't think I've ever let a time stretch resolve. Maybe once or twice. But I'm just done. I'm like, right, you got it. You know what? I can't beat that. I've had people resolve time stretch and then just draw a couple extra cards, go, I can't do anything, and go, go. And I'm just like, all right. You know it. Narset's not doing that. Oh, absolutely. You know she's not because we got five more cards to talk about. One of those spells could be Omniscience. All your spells are free. It costs 10, but not really. I mean, your spells are already free. Why don't we just make them double free at this point? Yeah, now they're super mega free of like, you can chain card draw and the game's really probably over. Um... The way you want to end the game with Narset, there's probably plenty of options. Maybe there's some infinite combat things or just like combos that are just exist in the deck. But Narset herself is probably not going to do much game ending. She's just going to be attacking, getting you free stuff like Omniscience. Narset herself actually might not do too much commander damage, but you're going to want to make sure she doesn't die. So with Aqueous Form, it can't be blocked. So it just says Narset can't be blocked. Yeah, you get to you get a few scries, which is actually kind of a wombo combo when you attack with it. You're like, oh, land, I don't want that. And then you know the rest. You know the rest of the song and dance. But Aqueous Form, I love how janky it is. And actually, when you see it, you go, oh, no. <laughs> uh, scroll Rack is a complicated card, so I'm just going to read it. Two mana for an artifact, one tap, exile, any number of cards from your hand face down, put that many cards from the top of your library into your hand, then look at the exile cards and put them on top of your deck in any order, which means if you've got a banger in your hand that you're never going to cast because it's turn five and you're trying to cheat something out, you ship your hand down, draw some cards, then put them back, and you go, oh, hey, it's time stretch. Cast it for free. Also, putting things just not on the top, but a little farther down works with this commander too, because it's top four cards, like long-term plans. You search your library for a card, then shuffle and put it third from the top, or just play it if you're attacking with Narset already. Yeah, that means, you know, it's like put it into your hand, it costs zero. That's kind of what it feels like. Narset being like especially impossible to remove with spot removal is just so backbreaking. I will say though, Soul Shatter just messes her up. Like, Soul Shatter Im is embarrassing for Narset because she just dies. I think it messes up a lot of big threats and just commanders in general. Yeah, maybe we should have a pod together with Turgrid and Narset, and then we'll figure out the last two later. <laughs> uh, but I want to point out, Narset is six mana. So, like, if you had to play against this deck, I think nowadays with higher power decks, you could get around it a lot of the time with a well-timed Soul Shatter or something. But... Let's be real, all these decks, they're already powered up to the moon anyway. They have Jeweled Lotus. They can pay zero for an artifact, tap sack, make three for your commander. And they're going to use all this fast mana and crap to play Narsen on like turn two, three, four, to where now your window to interact is like, uh-oh, not very big. Yeah, I mean, this used to be a boogeyman way more than it is now, but also with all the faster mana, it becomes even more powerful now. Yeah, I mean, how many games did somebody go Soul Ring, Azorius Signet, and then play Narset like one or two turns later? You know that it happened to you way back then, and I'm sorry. This is your redemption by us saying that Narset is hated. Moving on to a card that recently just got a reprint in Commander Masters is Urza, Lord High Artificer. For two blue blue, you get a one for that says when he enters the battlefield, you create a zero zero colorless card instruct artifact creature token that gets plus one plus one for each artifact you control. You can tap an untapped artifact you control to add a blue mana, or you could pay five, shuffle your library, then exile the top card. Until the end of turn, you can play that card without paying its mana cost. This deck gets so nasty, especially with certain taxing and stacks effects and just putting down artifacts so cheaply. Yeah, cascading artifacts into each other because they all now tap for one. So an artifact that does something and doesn't make mana now makes mana. Zero mana uh, ro uh, rocks don't really exist permanently. They do now. Lotus Petal actually just taps for blue, and you can just keep doing that. Treasure Tokens, yeah, you can just keep tapping them for blue. The ability is also tied to Urza, so even if you play Stony Silence, doesn't matter. Urza still just makes mana. Hard to stop. It's the enabler plus the payoff, and I think that there's just this... And, and he even comes with, like, a 10-10. They're just stapled on. That's not even the scary part, but you just get one. Yeah, for fun. Basically for free. <laughs> and then also, it's an artifact, so it basically means that Urza costs one less or generates a mana right away because the ability doesn't need summoning sickness. It doesn't care if a creature has summoning sickness. Like the construct that just enters, doesn't matter. There's so much going on. Everyone hates them. Let's get to why. Absolutely. One is Winter Orb. You know, the card that Amber plays quite a lot. All the time. <laughs> as long as it's untapped, players can't untap more than one land during their untapped steps. 
but it doesn't matter for you because you're gonna have so many tiny artifacts that you can just tap for as much mana as you need. It literally doesn't matter for you because it says as long as Winter Orb is untapped. So before your turn starts, you tap it to make a blue and then it doesn't even apply to you. So it only applies to everyone else and it was already asymmetrical to begin with. So no one gets to play magic except you and uh, then you just win. I mean, I think Winter Orb is one of the, if not the saltiest card in the format. It's like top five. Oh, absolutely. So people see this and they go, oh God, like not this again. Yeah, I don't need any more synergy with Winter Orb. It's already brutal. I thought this next one was interesting. It's Grafdigger's Cage. It doesn't really do that much, but Urza decks get to play cards like this that just shut off graveyard decks. They shut off tutoring from your library to play, like, you know, Finale of Devastation or something. Um... It stops that, and the cost is very low, because you're going to play this as a one-mana artifact, and it taps for blue, like 90% of the game. So you just get to play, like, Super Duper Signet, and also it shuts off, eh, I don't know, like 10% of Commander decks? I mean, all one-mana artifacts in this deck are free, so long as you have Urza out. Mm -hmm. So it's going to shut down so much stuff passively, and then, oh, you just happen to get all your mana back. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like the opportunity cost gets way lower when it replaces itself for mana. What is the next one? The next one is Aetherflux Reservoir. When you cast a spell, you gain one life for each spell. You cast that turn, and if you pay 50 life, you can laser beam someone in the face for 50 damage or to any other target, too. Yeah, I don't... This is just how they win. They're spinning wheels so intensely that all of a sudden they're at 250 life, and you're all getting laser beamed in the face. I'm actually surprised you don't have this deck, considering you are such a wheel-spinny like player. Even I have limits. <laughs> See, I will spin wheels, but at what cost? Not this one. <laughs> because you can't sack your baubles in this one? Yeah, I have to tap my bubbles. I don't want. I want to sack Mitra's bubble. Uh, what about Mirrored and Besieged? Mirrored and Besieged is a two and a blue enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you choose Mirian and or Phyrexian. Uh, Mirian says when you cast an artifact spell, you create a one-one colorless mirror artifact creature token. Or Phyrexian says at the beginning of your end step, you draw a card, then discard a card. Then if there are fifteen or more artifact creature artifact cards in your graveyard, target opponent loses the game. I think this is just really funny. Yeah, I mean, all you gotta do is just spin your wheels. Eventually, artifacts will end up in the graveyard. Maybe you play this early, make 1-1s, one bounce it or something, I don't know, with like a chain of vapor, and then you replay it and just kill people one by one. It's like, kind of a feels bad to just die out of nowhere. Ursa does not need to attack you at all. He's just gonna go, would you look at that? 15 artifacts, you're dead. Yeah, I was actually wondering if people were playing, um, like extra turn spells or flicker spells for this card in this deck. Oh, I'm sure there's plenty of extra turn spells in this deck. Why not, right? <laughs> Why not just add the salt to the Urza decks? No one likes Urza. You're never going to gain favor by playing Urza, so you might as well just be the bad guy. I mean, talking about salt in general, unwinding clock, untap all artifacts you control during each other player's untap step. This just has so much salt potential, especially if all your stuff is tapping for all the mana, plus you have a ton of instants. Yeah, you're holding up all your instants, artifacts with activated abilities, you can just keep spamming them, like uh, even like random stuff, like Walking Ballista, you're like, all right, I've got 12 artifacts, we'll just start putting three counters on it every turn, eventually just machine gun somebody out of the game. Unwinding Clock, real annoying in this deck. Tezzer at the Seeker could also be annoying. I'm not going to read the whole card. It's a five-mana Planeswalker that searches for artifacts or untaps artifacts. Don't even read the ultimate, it's embarrassing, but I guess it could win the game in a pinch. But it's just going to find Soul Ring and Mana Crypt and Mana Vault and all this stuff and Winter Orb. Everything you just read that you hated and you went, ooh, that's icky. Tezzeret finds it right when you don't want him to. Yeah, you think that artifact tutors like Fabricate would be good. And they are. But Tezzeret for all the free stuff, that's so gross. And then he just starts untapping things too. Like if you get a Guild of Lotus out, you know, he's just going to start ramping you up so you can spam Urza on your main phase when you can cast all these other artifacts and other creatures for free. Oh, Tezzeret. Tezzeret's actually a bad guy, so I don't... That makes more sense. But Urza's like... Oh, Urza's a horrible person. Yeah. He's like one of the worst people ever. That's why this deck is one of the most horrible things ever. Isn't everyone in Magic like Loki a bad person? Kind of. They kind of are. Um, then they, they make sense that Urza would play Force of Will. Free counterspell to back up all this stuff. Just when you think you've cracked the defense and you've penetrated the Urza's fortress of Graf Digger's cages and Mishra's baubles. Nope. They had Force of Will the whole time. You fool, what were you thinking? I mean, are you surprised though? The mono blue player who has this very sweaty, high powered commander is like, oh no, you know, I wasn't going to run any of the free counter spells. You got me. Yeah, I stop at Winter Warp. No, I had to throw it in there just because that's the salt. Oftentimes in, in dark times like these, when the salt seems too palpable, there's Moxville.com to save us. You know, right when we're in the middle of this and you go, I can't believe that all these cards exist in the same deck. Moxville lets you look at the deck, go, 
that's a salty pile of garbage. I would never build that myself. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And then you can go build a different deck that you'd find more enjoyable. That's always what this is about. It's just about finding the most fun deck for yourself. Moxfield also lets you take someone's existing deck list, copy it over to your account, and then just edit it as you need. So if someone says, oh, this is my Urza deck, but it has Winter Orb in it, and you said, I like everything but that, you just copy it over and take it out, and you put something else in. It's the best way to build a deck. You're missing out. Even with salt-inducing cards, there's plenty of plenty of fun to be had, and plenty of time to be saved when you build. But as of, as as all salty commanders do, uh, some of them don't want to save you time. Like Grand Arbiter Gustin the Fourth, he wants to waste your time exclusively. Two blue white for two three white spells you cast cost one less. Blue spells you cast cost one less. Spells your opponents cast cost one more. We're gonna slow this game all the way down. I mean, this is the stacks boogeyman mm -hmm. of the entire format. This is the one where I, when I started playing, everyone was like, you can't play that. If you play that, everyone's going to just hate you on the spot. Yeah, and I think it's just important to talk to your playgroup if you want to play one of these commanders. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. People just get salty when they see things like Aura of Silence. Your artifacts enchantments cost two more, and I can sack it when you try to destroy this so that you want to, because you want to play magic. You try to destroy this, I just destroy your best thing in, in response. I mean, this is definitely a good card. I know how much you love this card. I think this card's sweet. I love it. I think when it's like one of many of this type of effect, it's really annoying. Uh, but honestly, you know what? I will take responsibility for playing an annoying card. <laughs> I mean, this deck has all of the stacks pieces just crammed into it, like even Mind Sensor. Two white for a 2-1 flash flyer. When an opponent would search the library, they top search the top four instead. Most of the time, it's like a counter spell. It's like, oh, you fetch? Nope, ruin that, and now you kind of can't do it in the future because why would you want to search four cards? Yeah, I mean, it's really good if someone's like Demonic Tutoring or something. It's just really funny if you're doing it in response to a fetch. Yeah, Demonic Tutor, you mean Impulse? <laughs> wow, what a good card. <laughs> yeah, Grand Arbiter decks also love the word can't. So Narset Part of Veil says you can't draw more than one card each turn, but only your opponents. We can still do that. Uh, so we're going to minus two, find some spells, find some more stacks pieces, and you're going to go draw a card. It's not going to help against the board, not going to be able to crack through, and then you're going to pass the turn, and then it'll be my turn very soon. Oh, absolutely. And then you're going to try your best to find the windfall, make sure everyone else can only draw one, and they just have that card sitting in their hand for the rest of the game. It's and they're really sad about it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Draenoth Magistrate shuts off opposing commanders, shuts off graveyard stuff. Just a really brutal card. Uh, there was talk a while back about banning this card because it's just so like openly against the spirit of the format, and I could see it, but... As long as it's legal, the Grand Arbiter stack stacks can play it and make your deck have a bad time. I mean, I feel like with every commander in this list, there's always going to be at least one card where it's like, you know, there was talks about banning this at one point. Yeah, I, you know what? Go back and let us know about each one, because that's definitely true. I was like, I could count at least 12, two. It was like Turgrid, right? Yeah. And then uh, Urza with what? Winter Everyone hates Winter War. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, Archive of Amiria is a good example of the rule of law. Players can't. Love that word. Uh, cast more than one spell each turn, and non-basic lands your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped, slows you down, and really super slows you down because you can't even double spell. Double spelling is like how you win commander games. I mean, Grand Arbiter is basically permissions.deck, right? It's like, can I do this? No, sorry. Nah, try, try again later, you the can conch. Do it, yeah, do it once, maybe. But yeah, Grand Arbiter is the magic conch. <laughs> no. <laughs> but he still lets you play magic, like with Fate Spinner. You know, he says, I'm not going to skip your turn you just have to skip one of the key parts of your turn like combat or your draw step or your main phase and you really can't skip main phase so it's probably combat or draw step only for your opponents of course though. i wouldn't want to do that to myself no of course that's no. the entire point of this deck make sure your opponents aren't having fun right and then like when when all that stuff hits the board and the game is grinding to this halt you think how could they ever win but that, even that will be a little bit anticlimactic because... You're going to be playing Approach of the Second Sun. Uh, you got to cast it twice, but if you cast it that second time, you win. Yep, you just pay seven mana twice and you win over like a really long time. But we just mentioned this deck is perfect at making other decks sit there for a really long time, accomplishing nothing. Like that's a really good strength of the deck. This deck's very good. Sticking all of the like restrictors and stacks pieces, that's going to make opponents like squirm. It's going to get you... It's going to mean you can play very few in conditions really consistently, but it's not the most enjoyable deck to play against because, you know, of all the stuff we just read. Yeah, this is a slog of a deck to fight against. So if you see this across the table, be ready. Yeah, now the next one is actually a little bit testament to how people just want you to kind of leave their stuff alone. Send triplets to white, blue, black for a 3-3. It's an artifact creature. It's the beginning of your 
At the beginning of your upkeep, choose target opponent. This turn, that player can't cast spells or activate abilities and plays with their hand revealed. You may play lands and cast spells from that player's hand this turn. I mean, I don't know anyone who's playing Commander who's like, you know, I'd really rather my opponent play my turn. You Actually, know? I'm going to just sit this one out. I got to go to the bathroom anyway. You just play cards from my hand. Uh, that's fine. And you, you might wonder, how do they know which opponent has the best hand? Well, they can play cards that are actually really miserable, like Telepathy, which says everyone plays with their hands revealed. Everyone. Now, everyone has perfect information. I think this card in general kind of slows the game down in like a really miserable way, but it gives sent triplets the information that they need of like, oh, who has the best hand? Who can I triple spell from? And then it means that on average, each person who gets sent tripleted loses more cards on on average because they can cast more spells from you. Oh, absolutely. Plus the fact that it is just opponents, of course. I think there is a version where everyone, not just opponents, play with their hands revealed, but this is just miserable because you go, <laughs> not for you. The deck also gets to play really weird cards like Paradox Haze, which gives you an extra upkeep. Extra upkeep is great for Sentry Floods. I can now target two of my opponents, play all their stuff, and the last person just could be sweating bullets knowing that they're next. <laughs> Psych Rift is also one of the most brutal cards in this deck because you return the non-land permits you don't control to their owner's hand, which obviously if you're taking everyone else's, they barely have anything else. So it's just a full board wipe. And, and But like, you fire it off right before your turn, they might not see it coming because it's an instant, and they go, oh no, all our stuff is gone, we have to completely rebuild. But even worse, all the stuff that's gone is now in your hand, and I will take the best things that were on the board for myself and cast them all right now. Ugh. Just, that's pretty dirty. Yeah, you Rifted know what's coming. Triplets is dirty. <laughs> wow, that's rough. Worst Fears is another one that comes up in Send Triplets decks. You control target player during that player's next turn for seven and a black. That is just, no, I mean, no one likes having their turn controlled. Sometimes right? you just cut out the middleman, right? This is actually a little bit worse because uh, Send Triplets takes your cards during my turn. So, like, my turn kind of uses your cards, but this just says I get your whole turn. So, you have to wait for player A to go, player B to go, player C to go, then your player D. But it, I'm going to take your turn. You don't get an extra one. Then you got to wait for player A, player B, player C, and now you get to do something. And you're just so far behind on being able to contribute to this game in any meaningful way that you're just like dead in the water. I mean, at least it gets exiled, but, and it's seven and a black, at least it's not like two and a black. No, don't know? worry. They got Mind Slaver, they got Emrakul, they got yeah. all the flavorful inclusions. Oh, absolutely. We've all been hit with a really bad bribery before. You're going to search target opponent's library for a creature card, put it in the battlefield, and then they shuffle. So you're going to get the best thing that they have. It's just going to be sitting there goes and just mocking them from the other side of the table. Yeah, five mana for their best thing, which often costs more than five mana. Kind of leads to some feel-bads. People don't like playing against bribery because it's like, oh, my Avacyn. Like, I was excited to cast that, and you didn't even cast it. You just played bribery and stole it. I didn't sign up for this bribery. Uh, Padim, Console of Innovation, Secretly Miserable. Artifacts you control have Hexproof, and I mentioned before that Send Triplets is an artifact, so like you're kind of doing all your ramping, you know, you're getting Chromatic Lantern set up so you can cast other spells out of your colors, and then like now your stuff can't be interacted with, so it's like a just a complete shield you have that they have to kill Padim first before they can interact with any of your other stuff, because then Send Triplets the whole time is going to be like, Make yes. that noise, too. <laughs> Stealing the deck. And Vega, also, because when you cast spells from anywhere other than your hand, you draw a card. So you're going to have a stacked hand, and you're going to be casting everyone's stuff. It's so funny. This I don't know why the wording makes me laugh so much. It just says, whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand, draw a card. like, oh, your hand. <laughs> I want to draw a card because it's a spell that's not in my hand. I thought it's so funny. I've never seen that before. Uh, hilarious. But also, miserable. I think we've all had a bad time against a Yuriko deck before. One blue and a black for a 1-3 with Commander Ninjutsu, which doesn't get affected by Commander Tax. Why? So they're always going to be casting it for a blue and a black. When a ninja you control deals combat damage to a player, reveal the top card of your library, put it into your hand. Each opponent loses life equal to that card's mana value. So you're going to want a, little, a bunch of little dorks hitting in for almost no damage, you know, and then get... Yuriko in for two mana every time and then just flip the biggest stuff off the top of your library that you can. Yeah, and then their opponents are losing life and you're casting the big things and it's just a whole mess and there's just some cards that you don't you don't see all the time that like overlap perfectly for this deck, like Temporal Trespass. It costs 11, but not really because it has dealt and it takes an extra turn. So you can go, you know, attack you with some, some nonsense. Here's Yuriko. Trigger, take 11 each opponent. So that's 33 damage you just dealt for nothing. And then you draw it and then you cast it and do it all again next turn for a different spell. 
And you're going to want to stack the top of your library to be whatever you want to flip off, right? So <laughs> Whatever off. I want to flip off. <laughs> These Yurko players, man. <laughs> Limb duels bombs. Blue and black, you look at the top five. You can pay one life. You can put them at the bottom and then just look at the next five. And you can put them on the top at in any order that you choose. I think that's what it says exactly, word for word. Uh, this card is miserable. I, I just think it takes forever to resolve. Like, there's nothing really wrong with it. It's basically a tutor. But like, oh man, does this take a long time. So this is a salty card of like, I don't really want to sit here for five minutes when you look at your whole deck because it only costs one life to repeat. But it is really, really good with Yurko. Once you find a stack of five, that's like four drop, six drop, eight drop, eight drop, ten drop. You just leave them and you start smacking with ninjas. I mean, I feel like you know what you're looking for. You're either looking for that one piece of interaction to make sure that someone has like no blockers so you can actually swing in, or you are looking for that giant mana spell so everyone can lose 10, 12, 16 even. Yeah, uh, one of my favorites for this deck because it's so unplayable everywhere else, but so backbreaking here is Insidious Dreams. It's a four mana instant and you gotta discard X cards, but you just search for X cards and put them on top. That doesn't sound appealing unless you're about to draw all of them, deal 40 damage to your opponents, and if they somehow don't die, they're all extra turn spells, so you take extra turns now. Yeah, I don't have not seen this anywhere else. But If it, you do see it, you lose immediately. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of cards in this deck like that, though. Kind of, sort of, because there's a bunch of 11 drops pinging you for 11. Only 11? Well, who are like the real culprits, though? Because there's a few like people who are sitting on the sidelines in this deck trying to act all innocent, but this is their fault. Yeah, we're looking at you, <laughs> Ornithopter. Yeah, stop looking at me like that, you stupid O2 flyer. You are the reason Yurko's hitting on turn two every time. Changeling Outcast. I know. It's you. This is your fault. And you know what you're coming into? You're coming into Draco. 16 mana, that's 16 damage to everyone's face. I also love that Draco basically has no text box. It's uncastable, but Yurko just treats it like a brick burn spell. It's, oh man, it's so brutal. Even Yurko can take advantage of like the MDFCs. I love an MDFC, but Yurko turns them against me because now they're drawing lands, but the land still pigs me for damage. <laughs> I mean... Uh, Yuriko players are actually changing Draco to Shadow of Mortality because it's actually castable, yet still hits for 15 mana. Yeah. Fallen Shinobi is another one that we love to play in Blue Black Ninjas, like in the cube. When it hits, you exile the top two of the opponent's library, and you can play those for free. That gets real salty turn four. Yeah, when you start casting like some of their best spells, or you spike a really good one, it can be frustrating for them. It's kind of like one of the backups of like, oh, you know, Yuriko's stuck on the battlefield or something. I don't know how. Oh, Ornithopter, actually, though, whoosh, Fallen Shinobi takes some damage and here's some free spells. I think this is the least annoying card we've talked about by a mile, uh, but it is, it can be backbreaking and, and like annoying in certain scenarios. Yeah, you know, this video is actually just an Ornithopter hate video. It is. Uh, we, uh, this is actually directed specifically at Ornithopter, I hate you. All right, but if you're looking for time consuming, Grand Arbiter's got nothing on Krakashima. Krak, the Thunless, is one in red for a 2 2. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, flip a coin. If you lose the flip, return the spell to its owner's hand. If you win the flip, copy it, and you can choose new targets for the copy. Krak has partner, partners with Sakashima of a thousand faces. Three and a blue for a 3 1. You can have her enter as a copy of a creature you control, except it has Sakashima's uh, other abilities. And the legend rule doesn't apply to permanents you control, and it's partner. So, what the, pl deck, the game plan is, Krak on turn two. Sakashima on turn four. Now you got two Krarks. You copy Krarks. And now when you start casting instant sorceries, let's just use Lightning Bolt as an example. You know, maybe I even want more Krarks so I can like write a replication in it. So now I have three Krarks. Cast Lightning Bolt, three Krark triggers. Let's say I hit, all right, copy it, copy it, return it to my hand. I just paid red. I just paid red and spent 30 seconds of your life to get two Lightning Bolts and a Lightning Bolt back in my hand, which I can now just cast again to get all three triggers again. It's a lot. You know, I think out of these commanders, this is the one you find the saltiest because it just takes up so much time. The CDH community was like having a real problem with this when it was a meta deck because you it's not a terministic. You can't shortcut the stuff. If you have 75 coin flips, you have to flip them all. You have to resolve them in the order that it is. And it's just ridiculous. It's just a little bit much. I think when they made Krark, they made him cost like no mana for some reason. Like Krark should probably cost four or five mana. It's a really good effect. They didn't do that. So this just leads to, in my opinion, one of the most time-consuming, like, uneventful, you know, forced 
triggers decks that I just, uh, you know, this might be my least favorite, at least as of how it plays out, because I don't even think it's that fun to play. You know, it just really drowns you in triggers. I mean, some people just love, you know, flipping coins, spinning the wheels, seeing what happens. But even you, this is a bit much. Yeah, because you know what's going to happen. You're going to lightning bolt someone for 35 times, you know, like, you know. That's all you need to win. Uh, Phyrexian Metamorph is going to see play. It just going to copy the Krark that is a Sakashima that says the legend doesn't, the legend rule doesn't apply. You can actually, if you have Krark and a Sakashima Krark, you can copy either one because one of them says the legend rule doesn't apply. But preferably, you'd rather them bolt than two of them say that in case one of them dies. This is confusing, but you're just going to get extra Karks. Yeah, and the Karks Thumb, which is both flavorful and useful in this deck, because if you'd flip a coin, you flip two and ignore one. Dear God, do we have time for that? <laughs> no, but you should still play it in this deck. It's still really, really good. BZ is the saltiest about this. It's it's just so much time. I, I want to play more than one game over the next week. Uh, the Kark, uh, Karks Thumb is, is really brutal. Storm Kill an Artist. This is, might be how the game just ends. You know, when I see this card out and you start doing this stuff, I'll probably concede because this one gives you a treasure whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell. So if I'm throwing out lightning bolts and have five Krarks out, it's over. Like realistically, numbers wise, you're done. It's because they're just going to get one of those f triggers will bounce the lightning bolt back to their hand and some of them will copy it. That gives you treasures and damage and it's just repeatable. I'm not going to lie when you said this is what ends the game. I thought you were going to talk about someone like getting beat in the face with like a 40, like a 42 storm killing artist. No, I, you know what? I think that the reason we're a little sick is because of these commanders. We're getting more sick the more we talk about them. <coughs> <coughs> the, we do these things all for you, audience member. You know, these commanders are so toxic. They're making us more <laughs> sick. Uh, Jessica's will is another brutal one. It's a mana production and a card draw. But like when it bounces itself and copies itself, you make seven mana and the seven mana can be used to recast it. So this is just like a win the game in a can card. It's it's honestly silly how good this card gets in this deck. I mean, it's already great in every deck, but this one is like the one. I mean, I think this is also a case of that like non-deterministic though. It is. It's like I'm going to bounce it seven times and then I'm going to cast it four times. Like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, you're just going to be like, all right, I can flip up 35 cards off the top. Like, not like, even like all of my library. And then I just say, you know what? You got me. <laughs> I want to be dead. I think I think you did it. Uh, Goblin Electromancer helps make this deck hum. and lets you get on board early with a, like a relevant permanent. And then it makes all your spells cheaper so that now it's easier to loop them and easier to replay them. And, and it's just a cheap little guy. I can't blame him for this deck. So Goblin Electromancer, you get a free pass. You're a cool little dude. Um, but you are hanging around with some of the wrong people, and I'm a little worried. Yeah, please get some help. Brain Freeze is one of the only win cons that this deck can really have. It was one of the only ones it needs. And so this is the bad man you have to stay away from. When a blue target player mills three cards, but it says Storm. So you're just going to copy this 10 billion times, uh, if you can actually count that many, though, because it's not deterministic, as we say again. Yeah, you have to count. Uh, but like Jessica's Will, looping that kind of thing, and Stormkill Artist giving you the mana back to cast the spells again, even if you're looping something irrelevant, like a Gitaxian Probe, um, which is also very, very good in this deck because it's free. Uh, this just lets you chain up Storm to where now the Storm is a bajillion. And even when you cast Brain Freeze, there's a good chance that the Krarks that you're making, the Krark copies, are going to bounce the original Brain Freeze, which lets you cast it again and get all the Storm copies again. And it's just, it's just savage. But I mentioned Gitaxian Probe being a free spell and kind of being extra annoying submerge is going to be brutality it's a free spell if an opponent controls a forest and you control an island which is basically a given so you can put a creature on top of its owner's library but with crark you're going to as the deck wants to assemble an army of crarks get enough triggers so that submerge comes back to your hand and copies itself and now you have an emblem that says pay zero put a creature on top of its owner's library your opponents will not be able to have anything stick and that's just like even nastier considering it is just free. That's just like feels bad. What's right? the doubt? Yeah, there's no cost to me. I just go, oh, I'll do it again. And you're like, crap. <laughs> but you, it's not a crap like, oh, crap, that resolves. It's like, oh, crap, flip six coins. <laughs> Hopefully you don't hit one return. Oh, there it is. Well, we still got to flip four more coins. Yeah, what about now? <laughs> so it's so upsetting. Yeah, these, I think, are the most hated commanders. I think we did a good spread here. Uh, apologies for us being under the weather, but, you know, we got to make that content for you. We got to make that content. And we'll see you at Commander Sealed. Uh, what's the fact of the day? Don't go outside or you'll get sick. <laughs>